Hey everybody, Charles from HumbleMechanic.com here today to talk about more failed Volkswagen parts. Today we're going to be talking about engine coolant temperature sensor. So today we're going to be talking about one of the parts that I've probably replaced more of than any other part that's not a maintenance part in my Volkswagen career, and that's the engine coolant temperature sensor. But before we get into the show, let's talk about the sponsor of the day, which is Deutsch Auto Parts. These guys are the Volkswagen Audi parts experts. Awesome service, incredible pricing, a ton of really great DIY videos. So check them out at shopdap.com. So what the heck is an engine coolant temperature sensor anyway? Well, like a lot of other car parts, if you look at the name of what it's called, it tells you exactly what it does. It's a temperature sensor that monitors the temperature of your engine's coolant. You may also see it referred to as a CTS, or a coolant temperature sensor, but for the show, I'm going to be referring to it as an ECT, engine coolant temperature sensor, because that's what I've always referred to it as. And when I read the acronym CTS, I always have to stop and think, what the heck is a CTS? And like I mentioned, I've replaced tons of these sensors. This is actually the very first time I've cut one open to take a look at what it looks like inside. So how do the engine coolant temperature sensors work? Well, inside the housing is something called a thermistor. It's basically a thermostatic resistor. So as temperature changes, the resistance value changes. In this case, it's an NTC, or negative temperature coefficient thermistor. So as temperature goes up, resistance of the sensor actually goes down. The values are then sent to one of the computers, either the ECM or the instrument cluster. They're interpreted by the computer and then represent a temperature value. So at every temperature, there's a given resistance value. We also have a few different styles that we're looking at. Some are four pin, others are two pin. It doesn't really matter whether it has two pins, four pins, whether the connector's square or rounded on one side. They basically all work the same. On the ECTs that are four pins, there's one sensor that sends a signal to the ECM and to the instrument cluster. On the two pins, that's actually a CAN bus signal from the ECM to the cluster. So how does an ECT fail? Well, first off, it can leak. It can leak from the seal that sits in the housing, or it can actually leak from where the plastic meets the brass. There is a tiny seal. It can leak from that seal. It can also leak in a very unhappy way, and that's through the electrical connection. And I've actually seen that cause coolant migration, where the coolant will come up through the sensor and go all through the wires and make a very, very unhappy vehicle, and in turn, a very unhappy customer. But a more common way that they fail is a broken connection inside of the sensor. As you can see here, there's a lot of little connections inside the sensor, and at any weak point, that can be a failure. And that can either cause a static problem or an intermittent problem. Typically, we don't see ECTs reading incorrectly. They either work or they don't work for the most part. You could also have a coolant issue causing corrosion or some sort of buildup on the brass portion here, and that may impact the ability for the ECT to read. When it comes to symptoms of failure, there's not a ton, but I have seen some ECTs do weird things. The most common is going to be a check engine light, and generally the fault will call out the ECT specifically. So it'll say ECT open circuit or coolant temperature open circuit. You may also get a fault that says malfunction in cooling system, and that can actually be anything inside the cooling system. Usually that's a thermostat problem, but I have seen it be a coolant temperature sensor issue as well. We can have issues with the temperature gauge where you're driving along, cruising, everything's cool, the temperature's at 190, and then it drops to zero. It may sit there for a few minutes and then pop back up to 190, or it may stay at zero the entire time. Basically, you can get an intermittent dropout of the temperature sensor. The one word of caution, never assume that a high reading of your coolant temperature is a failure of an ECT. If your temperature is at 190 and you start to see it creep up and up and up, don't assume that you have a bad coolant temperature sensor. Get it checked out and make sure that your vehicle is not actually overheating. That can cause catastrophic damage to your engine, a bad ECT. The absolute worst I've ever seen happen as a result of failure is a car not start. And that's kind of an out there symptom of this parts failure, but it can actually make your vehicle not start properly or run really, really poorly. Depending on whether it's a hot start or a cold start, failure of the coolant temperature sensor can cause a drivability issue, especially on first startup. If you're starting the vehicle after it's been warmed up, and you have a failed ECT, it may be just dumping fuel thinking that the vehicle's cold and cause a rough idle or misfires or, again, a no-start condition. So how do we diagnose a bad ECT? Well, if there's a fault, it makes it pretty easy. 
Generally, coolant temperature sensors are easy enough and cheap enough to just go ahead and put one on. It really does make a great starting point in your diagnostic process. And if you have a Mark IV or B5 Passat, if it's black, replace it. If it's green, you might still replace it anyway. But I promise you, if you have a black ECT in your car, go ahead and throw a new one on. They updated it to green for a reason. You can also do a resistance check of the sensor. The only problem with that is you need to have a chart to compare resistance value to temperature and you need to know the temperature. So you need to know what the temperature of the coolant is, what the value of the thermistor actually is supposed to be, and reference the temperature to that resistance value. If you have a scan tool, you can look at the values that way. It's really easy on the four pin ECT because we can look at it in the ECM, then we can look at it in the instrument cluster and compare the two readings. And they should be just about the same. If you have the engine reading, 20 degrees Celsius and the cluster reading 100 degrees Celsius, we know we have a problem either inside the sensor or in the wiring to the ECM. We can also, especially with VADCOM, graph the change in resistance of the ECT. We can pull the value block up and watch the resistance change. The problem with this is this is a very slow changing sensor. So watching the value block, you might not see a drop. You might, you might not. If we graph it and we see it, dump and then come back up, we know we have a problem there. But I will say for as cheap as these sensors are and as much as they fail, if I had an issue where I thought the coolant temperature sensor was a problem, I would probably put one in and see what happens. So is this a DIY? I would say about 70% of the time, this is a very easy DIY, especially on the older generation vehicles where they did fail more often than the new stuff. I would say once B6 and B5 and a half hit, they really stopped failing like they did in the older generation. And luckily the ones that failed the most often were the easiest to replace. A quick tip, always do these cold, it makes it a lot easier. If you're gonna replace it, take the coolant bottle cap off, then put it back on, then replace the coolant temperature sensor. That'll help you only lose just a little bit of coolant. Also, if you're gonna replace this, Always replace the clip and always replace the seal to prevent any leaking in the future. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap it up there. If you have any questions or comments, post it in the comment section below. Hey, if you got a part you'd like me to do a video on just like this, shoot me an email to charles at humblemechanic.com and put failed part in the subject. So if you like the video, throw it a thumbs up on YouTube. You can also subscribe on YouTube or on the blog at humblemechanic.com. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the blog, and obviously on YouTube. All right, everybody, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.